Welcome to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. We feature top entrepreneurs and thought leaders from around the world, those who bring a global mindset and a unique perspective to their life and business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, David Nilsson here, and I'm the host of this show. Uh, Here, I connect with business leaders from around the world who have this borderless mindset, and they can share you know, ideas and innovation, uh, maybe new best practices that can be a life uh, applied in both life and business, ultimately helping us to lead and grow in a rapidly changing world. Now, this episode is brought to you by Doxa Talent. Doxa helps businesses to source full-time, highly dedicated workers from around the world. And as a result, the companies can scale faster, uh, increase margin, and improve culture. To learn more about Doxa Talent, uh, go to doxatalent.com. All right, I'm really excited about uh, today's show. Today we've got uh, David Lekic, uh, who actually started his career as a lawyer. He was a managing partner of a law firm. Then he transitioned to investment banking before starting Dreamwater, which he served as the CEO until he actually sold the company in 2018, I believe. Um, Dreamwater is a natural zero calorie uh, liquid sleep enhancer. It comes in two and a half ounce bottles. You've probably seen it in uh, the drugstore, maybe as you're at the airport. Um, and it's in a format that you can take without drinking water. Today, he's consulting with and driving strategic initiatives uh, with a handful of companies that are in industries like CPG, uh, cannabis, travel, uh, and even executive coaching. I should also note that he holds an MBA for, uh, and a, a JD from the University of Miami, and he's still licensed to practice uh, law in Florida. So total underachiever. Uh, David, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I don't like to lead with the lawyer part because I like to say that if somebody's going to think I'm an asshole, let them, let me earn that. Not just because I told you I was a lawyer, but thanks, Dave, for blowing me up there. Yeah. We'll call it a recovering lawyer then. So there you go. Uh, too funny too. And by the way, I, I, I'm a I'm an extremely loyal uh, Delta Airlines customer. Have been my whole life. In fact, they just sent me this uh, beautiful box because I reached two million miles with them, which just means I travel way too much. But I had this like. Five. High five. I had this concoction that I had created, which I called my sleepy cocktail. And it was, um, I won't tell you all the components of it, but it included dream water. So when I first got a chance to connect with you, I was super excited because I actually was a raving fan. I told people about it constantly. And so if we can, I'd actually love to just start there. Where did you come up with the dream water concept? Well, as you noted, I was actually doing some investment banking in 08, 09, uh, when people used to say, what do you do? I say, I have a front row seat to the end of the world. Um, it was, you know, my second financial crisis in my adult life. The first one was I graduated from the University of Michigan Business School in 02 and the whole dot-com bubble had burst. And then the financial crisis in 08, 09. And, you know, we just came out of, you know, whatever whatever this was. Um, and and uh, I met my, my co-founder, Vincent, um, because he came into the office looking to raise some money, like so many people would. It, the, the issue was in placing it. Um, I took home this eight ounce sort of poorly packaged, uh, you know, concoction that was called dream water and, and uh, it worked on me and I, and the sleep aids don't work on me. So I was like, I was floored. Uh, and I remember waking up at, you know, 6am after a full night of sleep, I probably, you know, got to bed by like nine, nine thirty, which had never happened to me, you know, falling asleep before midnight in my late twenties, early thirties. And, um, and, and, and I woke up feeling like, oh my God, did I just discover the anti Red Bull? And then I guess that little fucked up entrepreneurial gene jumps in and says, but this has to exist, right? Like it's so logical that there's all these things that energize you in, especially in the liquid space. Right. And five hour energy was, was kind of getting going at that point. Um, and, and obviously Red Bull and things like that. So, so I was like, what well, this has to exist. And when I didn't find it literally anywhere online, I was in Manhattan. So walking in and out of every bodega that I could, I was like, man, let's go do this. And that's how Dreamwater got started. That's awesome. I, I, at what point? So, so you guys obviously then must have partnered together because it sounds like he had sort of, you know, come up with the concept. I was really struggling with where to go next steps, right? Um, yeah, it was more how to how do you launch it? And, and, you know, I had to grapple with that too because America, the United States is such a big territory. Yeah. The markets are all different. I mean, you're in Idaho and I'm in... Miami, Florida, we're both American, but totally different markets, right? So, and and the direct-to-consumer world was not as evolved as it is today. Back in 09, 2010, really was my first year uh, in market. So, 
it was just a totally different, um, you know, sort of world of panorama. And it was, how do you take this idea to market? Um, where, why, how, you know, and, and, and that was a fun part of getting started in this whole thing. Yeah. So how, how did you, I mean, at what point did you know you had a product market fit, right? So you took it home, you, you drank it, it worked for you, but like, just because you think it's a great idea, it doesn't mean like, you know, that everyone else will. So like, what was the signal that told you, ah, I need to scale, like it's time to go? It was probably even earlier than that. Um, uh, Vincent had won a Syracuse business plan competition, even though he didn't go to Syracuse, his brother did. And that gave him the initial seed capital to, pr- to make an initial production on a dream one. So it was all these eight ounce bottles, the one that he handed me. And I had the same feeling as you, right, Dave, where I was like, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a case study of one. So he probably gave me like 100 to 200 bottles. And I gave it out to as many people as I could. And I, I want to say I had almost 100%, if not 100%, amazingly positive response rates. And most of the time, it was like, how do I get more? And, and that gave me this little indication that it's not just me, right? Especially because sleep aids don't work on me. So I could take a Tylenol PM right now, and you won't notice a difference in my energy levels or anything like that. It just doesn't do much for me, the type of hydromine. Uh, that is so common in the over-the-counter uh, sleep aids. And so that gave me, you know, a lot of momentum right out the gate, you know, in terms of internal momentum to really want to go after this. And for what it's worth, I did look at almost the entirety of the journey, but especially the beginning of Dreamwater, all is like a case study, like a real world, let's put it out there. Let's do the best that we can in terms of how we put it out there. We launched with Dwayne Reed in, in Focus on Manhattan in um, in mid-December 2009 with the idea of putting the city that never sleeps to sleep yeah. and and putting it out there and seeing what those interactions look like, seeing what the customer feedback looks like, seeing what the uptake looks like in the sell-through. So the entire thing was really just, you know, let's see, right? And, and I really had that mindset and that curiosity, I think, served me a lot of good as we were going through this. I wasn't attached to an outcome. I was more attached to creating the framework for Dreamwater to exist and letting the market to some degree dictate to me. So how am I doing? Right. Yeah. So it's funny. You sort of glazed over a point there that actually I didn't know about you. And I've, you know, in full disclosure to our listeners, I've known Dave for a couple of years, uh, high regard for the work that he's done. But, you know, as I shared earlier, I, I used to see dream water in the airports all the time, still do actually. And I still use it. Um, but that wasn't the initial initial distribution strategy. You talked about Dwayne Reed here. I, I I read as I was preparing for this about your launch in Manhattan. So can you just tell a little bit more about that and how you guys came up with it? And then what did you learn from it? Um, I think that the, I'll start with the learning point. It was that we were very good at opening the door. And I was very clear that our goal was to open the door and let Dreamwater itself do the selling. Because... You know, one of the things that we were faced with a lot was, you know, debating whether or not we should do clinical studies and things like that or whatever. There's a lot of legal reasons to do it. There's a lot of uh, marketing reasons to do it and what have you. But I always ultimately said no to that because what I cared about most, again, you know, Johnson Johnson with Tylenol PM can trot out whatever they want in terms of um, studies on diphenhydramine and how it works for me, but there's no perfect sleeping. So what I really wanted to do was make sure that I got into people's hands first and foremost, right? That was always my goal. Uh, and putting it out in people's hands. And you found it, by the way, because Seattle Tacoma was a huge market for us in terms of airport travel retail, um, because there's so much, let's say, red-eye flights or, or distance flights from there. There, LAX, I mean, we'd crush it with Hudson News and that type of retailer in the airports uh, because of those reasons. But when we when we looked at the market and we, you know, a couple of my the people that I brought in, it was a, a team of four of us total that I brought in. Um, it was my younger brother, Joseph, and then uh, Vincent and another friend of mine, Adam. Um, we had all had roots, or certainly three out of the four of us had roots in and out of Manhattan. Um, and then we really looked at this and I said to myself, but why am I going to putz around on the periphery? In other words, I'm from Miami. It would have been the, the easiest thing in the world to, to launch in Miami. But again, the thesis, it was all a thesis. Like, do we have something or not? And I and, and, and up until the launch time, I would only talk to you about what Dreamwater was if you signed an NDA. And then you'd say to me, what am I signing an NDA for? I said, you have to sign the NDA and then I'll tell you. I was a stupid 29-year-old, um, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. So, but in my mind, I was like, once I come into market, there's no more NDAs. There's no more secrecy around this because it was so unique and novel and it just didn't exist that um, I said, you know what? If we're going to go, let's go into New York. And once we decided New York, I also had this sort of mindset around, you know, fish where the fish are. So if I told you, go get me a, you know, a single can of Coke, you'd probably in your mind think 7-Eleven or a local convenience store, right? And if I said to you, go get me a, 
a sleep aid or a headache medicine or whatever, your default will, will tend to be a drugstore. So Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, whatever. Um, and, and so when I thought about New York as a geography, again, America's huge. But when I thought about New York as a geography and this idea that I want to be in a, in a, in a drugstore, Dwayne Reed became very obvious. And then one of my guys, Adam, happened to, when we, when we settled in on Dwayne Reed, um, it turns out that the beverage buyer at the time, this lady Jackie, used to do Christmases with, with him and his family. I mean, coincidence of the world, right? And so we reached out to her. And like I said, we were good at opening doors. And then we put it in front of her. It was very unique, very novel, a lot of white space that doesn't really exist um, in today's CPG world. And um, that's how we started. It worked. I love that fish where the fish are. I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, sort of take the build it and they will come strategy. I love that you went to go find out, you know, you, you went out and sought out the places where people are going to instantly be, that would be um, drawn to that. Talk, talk to me a little bit about, I, you know, with, with business, I love that, you know, we always share the positive stuff, like everything that was going well, but I just curious if there's any times in your journey there at Dreamwater where you, where you guys were on the ropes or were you really up against something challenging and, and sort of what that looked like? Yeah. Like every day. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Dave, are most days awesome for you? You know, like as a, you know, in, in your role, like, um, well, the reason I asked the question, because I remember when I started my first, you know, real entrepreneurial venture guide and financial, we were in the real estate and business environment in 08. And I remember 08, we had to make some really tough decisions because the market, you know, real estate had imploded, small business finance had dried up, the stock market was crashing, unemployment, like there were so many issues happening during that time that, you know, that was a time when I felt really against the ropes. And so I'm wondering if there's something similar for you. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I was being, you know, a bit jokey about it, but I think, you know, most days suck, if I could just be blunt about it. And I don't mean suck like I walked around the press or whatever. It's just like, they were either mundane or, you know, it always felt like we were taking a step forward and two steps back, you know, you know, a lot of that. And I think that one of the things that we have to worry about as entrepreneurs is, you know, as the leaders of our organizations is that it's incumbent upon us to, to exude strength, confidence, a vision, and, 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 you know, there's a whole other conversation around how do we draw that for ourselves and how do we, you know, communicate that outwardly. But we definitely had major hiccups along the road. Um, I would say the first, you know, three plus years, uh, as much of a grind as it was, it was fun as hell, man. When, when I look back at it, you know, we talk about culture a lot in, in EO, entrepreneurs organization and, uh, and all that, but none of it was designed for me. None of it was thought about. Not, not, none of it came because I went to a class and heard about culture. It just was. I was being me. That was... I think infiltrating sort of the the overall way that we were building the business and, and hiring people and who we were hiring and so on and so forth. And um, in September of 2013, it was a, a terrible month for me from my divorce perspective. I don't remember all the details. A lot of that sucked, but I don't remember, I just remember that month being terrible. And I had had my highest highs and lowest lows with Walmart, who was my key customer, about 30% of my business at that point. Um, in uh, in about a four month span, so I started this, the start of 2013 had hiring. It had real hockey stick growth curve, like you felt it. You know when you hear about this hockey stick growth curve, we felt it. We were on it for sure, um, and so the world was great. And then um, the program that they gave us ultimately, I always say it's not about getting into these stores; it's about how you're in these stores that matters. The program that they ultimately gave us was was never going to work. Um, we were, we got onto the front ends of, of Walmart, which is the mecca of all retailing, even now, and even with Amazon. And, um, and, but we were just at the bottom shelf in the front checkouts. And I've never seen somebody bend over to the front, you know, on, on a checkout to just explore a new sleep aid product. Anyway, all these things. And, and what happened by September is so we were unwinding from that front end of the relationship. We still had the relationship with the pharmacy department uh, at Walmart, but we were unwinding that front end relationship that was very problematic, very difficult. And so much of our work had, had been to lead up into that. It was very demoralizing. I lost three of my key team members. Vincent was one of them. I ultimately reconciled with him and, and, and brought him back, not on a W-2 basis, but on a 1099 basis. Um, and uh, I lost my head of finance, my head of ops. And I had to make real cuts, like real strong. Um, not that I had a bloated infrastructure to begin with, just to be able to survive that moment. Um, and that was definitely that, that you know, punch in the stomach uh, moment that I, I can point to in my dream water journey over eight plus years that almost, you know, was a knockout blow. Like, you know, like the markets were for you in 08, 09 for guidance. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I, I just, I always feel it's important to sort of expose the good and sort of the challenging things that come along with, you know, what you do. You talk uh, a second ago, you were talking a lot about talent, right? And as you know, I started Docs of Talent to help businesses scale faster um, by accessing new labor pools across the world. And I think it's a really important capability for people to develop, to be competitive long-term. It's becoming more and more sort of widely accepted today, but you actually were, well, I would think a little more as an early adopter in that area. And as again, as I was preparing for this call and knowing some of the things about you, I did, um, I thought it'd be great to just hear your experience leveraging global talent to help build your business. You know, tell me where you, where you found that talent and what was that experience like for you? Yeah, you know, this idea of remote work and, and all of that is very commonplace for us now in a post-COVID, you know, reality. Um, but for me, I just remember even from the earliest, earliest stages, like even in 09, as we were thinking about this, whatever, whether we were in New York, Miami, wherever we happened to be. And even as we started the business, I always said, man, I just need my laptop, my cell phone, and that's it. Like, I don't care where I am. Uh, I was on the road a lot. Um, you know, you just told me you, you joined the 2 million mile club in, in Delta and I've gotten almost there with American the hard way because I don't do a lot of, you know, travel to China or, you know, Europe. It's it's mainly all domestic travel. And I never really cared, um, you know, where where things were located. Um, and, and, and if you look at a macro level and, and, you know, look at who I'm telling this to, but if you look at a macro level, not every geographic location is supposed to be great at everything, right? And, and, um, and so from my perspective, and really from the very beginning of this idea that I just had needed a cell phone and a laptop, um, it allowed me to build the, the organization in a way where even though we were based in Miami, I had literal employees all over, you know, different geographic points in the U.S., uh, mainly on the sales side. Uh, I ended up consolidating back into Miami at one point in the process. I, I almost the entirety of time had my production facilities between Dallas and Phoenix. Uh, I three PL'd out of Dallas. So I was always, if we want to call it a virtual company or whatever, even though I had my home office and a real office here in Miami, um, and, and most of my W-2 here. As part of all of that, my twin brother, Isaac, in Mexico has always had a lot of access to, you know, high-level people and, and through his own journey and endeavors and, 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 and all that in Mexico. So he'd always tell me about these people. And he had had this, this uh, operations lady who was just awesome. Her name is Kenya. And she was awesome. And then there was this moment in time where he's like, who wants her? Isaac's a great networker, uh, connector of people and all of that. And, and, and I was looking for help in, in, in streamlining a lot of my processes, establishing SOPs, you know, all that stuff, whatever. And this girl, Kenya, and she was, you know, in her twenties and just leaving a, a, a big department store chain there called Sanborns, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you know, she came in and fit right in. And then the next time that I needed something or I wanted something in terms of, you know, potential people, it, it wasn't like a weird thing to think like, Hey, Isaac, who else do you have in Mexico? Because what I was finding was, Kenya was a super high level talent, but I had, I was paying her less than I was paying my, my, my office worker, literally like my office admin to do almost nothing. Right. Like just to be around and, and, and organize the office, whatever. So that, that, that dichotomy in my mind was like, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know what, I'm going to go get the best people that I can. And this idea of remote work, which wasn't as ingrained as it is today, I was like, great. And Isaac has an office in Mexico. So when I hire them, I could just be like, great, go to that office in Mexico. Um, and not, not that they always went to the office in Mexico, but I ended up building a lot of my tech team out there. Um, and, and obviously Kenya, uh, she remained with me, you know, past me selling in Dreamwater. And, um, you know, it was always an, a, a great talent pool for me, but not because of the, pr- I mean, the price was a gravy. It was, I was finding really good talent there. Yeah. And then I'd crack into the cost, right? So yeah, that's what I always try and tell people is like, don't worry about the price, right? Like different geographies will offer different, you know, value, but you're, what you're looking for is high quality, highly skilled individuals who can help you go further faster. And it just turns out that when you look at other geographies that can align with making more aggressive bets as well. So uh, I just, yeah, it was interesting. I, I Right now, you're right, because of COVID, it's a widely more acceptable idea, whereas a little bit, it was harder for people to wrap their brain around. But hey, if I live in Idaho, which I do, I'm going to manage somebody from Florida. It's no different than if I manage from the Philippines or Ukraine or Mexico, lots of different places. Well, also because technology makes it a lot more seamless, right, Dave? Like we've hung out a couple of times in real life, but I consider you a pretty good friend, right? So 
it's 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 because we're able to do things like this and the the, te- the improvements in technology um, that I believe across the board, not just in, in in video conferencing or anything like that, that that allow for that to happen, right? No question. So, you know, I don't want to get some esoteric tangent, but you know, it's just we live in a more connected, easily connected world, and it doesn't. Again, if I didn't care where we were in 2010, let, let me be clear: in 2010, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have. Facebook as a legion, you know, entity the way it is today. You know, there was a lot, there was no Shopify, if I'm not mistaken. Like there wasn't a lot of stuff out there. Uh, but look at the advancements and one decade later, it's, this is just normal. Yeah. Yeah. The barrier, the barriers have come down significantly for that sort of digital communication. We were all forced into it anyway. So, hey, uh, let's talk about the exit. So we've kind of gone through the journey, but I, you know, so many entrepreneurs, I think uh, their identity is tied to the business that they have. And, you know, you chose to sell, Dreamwater, which as I, I know is a very successful exit. Walk me through the emotional side of selling. What was that? What was that? I mean, when you started the process, it's probably really exciting, but like you, you signed the paperwork, deal is done, money's in the bank. Like what happened after that? Like how, how did you sort of reconcile that? Oh, today's a different day. So no, that's a great question. And we could start there. Um, you know, for me, I was you know, we've done exercises in our, I've referenced EO entrepreneurs organization, there's chapters all over the world. And, um, you know, it's a forum really that you have in a safe space to go in and and communicate for those of you that don't know what EO is, but you have your own forum and you communicate about, you say things out loud that you wouldn't say to other humans. And that's one of the beautiful things about EO. And it helps fill in this gap of let's call it loneliness or whatever you want to call it as being like the person that has to run, run the show and, and all of that stuff. And I did a lot of work, in the sale process, because we have monthly meetings, I, I did a lot of the work leading up to that signing of the paper and getting wired the money um, to make sure that we were clear, that I was clear with my journey, that I was good with my process inside of my EO group. Um, and that helped a lot. Um, it helped really a lot for me because I was able to, to, to be present to, not just be reactive to and, and keeping in the subconscious, that 100% of my identity uh, was tied into Dreamwater. Like I would go to dinner with friends and all they wanted to do, even if they had cool jobs, was talk to me about Dreamwater. It doesn't matter what it was. So I couldn't even escape it when I was just being me and and uh, and just living my life. And um, and so to be able to come out of that process, not only that, but Dreamwater and my daughter uh, are the same age. I had them in the same year uh, or I started them in the same year, if I could say it like that. And And so in the most literal sense, Dreamwater was like one of my babies. And just being able to go into the room and, 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 and be clear about it, what, what really worked for me was feeling good and complete about my journey that I, I really gave it my all. I, you know, it didn't turn out to what exactly I thought it could be and would be, but I was, I, was, I was satisfied enough with the outcome, not just financially, but just, you know, how it ended up that um, when we went to, when I, when I looked at that moment in time, I said to myself, look, Either they're going to grow it and scale it and turn it into something awesome, right? Of which it, I'm a part of that story, right? So I was rooting for that, right? I want my baby to do well. Or they're either going to keep it in neutral or sink it, in which case it'll be like, I was able to do more with less resources because the company that bought me post-closing had over $60 million in their bank account with no debt. I mean, they imploded over the next couple of years very, very quickly, but um you know, I just look at, you know, with the huge teams and things and whatever, and it, you know, it hasn't continued to scale like crazy, which would have been my preference, but I was very complete with both outcomes because that was it. That was the entire, in my mind, potential outcome, either they're going to kill it or it's going to stay flat and decrease. And either way, I feel, I feel, I felt good about it for myself, my own selfish interests. Yeah, that, that's good. I've, I'm curious, I'm coming away from that experience. You know, I, I, I remember I started guiding financial and I felt like we were figuring it out as we went, right? Like it was a new entrepreneur sort of learning as we go, started docs of talents. I felt like I was way better prepared that time around to, to really lead an organization. Just curious, like if you were to start a business today, what would you do differently than maybe what you did when you first started uh, Dreamwater? You know, I, I, uh, I think it's, it's, it's too open-ended of a question because I think it, it depends on the nature of the business. Um, you know, I stepped out of, uh, dream water. And we had started with my family, a cannabis business um, that I've nurtured all along the way. 
and uh, mainly in a problem solver role, right? Kickstarting it and then mainly in a problem solver role um, in a really nice, it, not nice, I shouldn't say nice, in a really complex, crazy, challenging environment called cannabis. Um, you know, starting it in like 2014, you know, at least really looking at it in 2014 when, you know, you couldn't even, we had to have debates around how do we tell my mom that we're doing this? Like literally me and my brothers would have debates. Like how do we tell our mom that we're, we're doing this cannabis thing? Um, you know, cause it's n- none of us are really stoners or anything like that. It's not like a logical, you know, next step, um, you know, acceptance into the, the, the extended family and community and whatever, that was also a little bit tricky. Um, I, it just really depends on, on, on what I think that op- not to punt the question, but just, it depends on what that opportunity is. I feel like, you know, from what I know about, you know, DOXA is you were already doing a lot of that stuff, right? You were using it for yourself. You were already in that mindset. You were already thinking about those things and doing those things for you. You just had this epiphany that there's a lot of me's out there that could, that could benefit from the two plus years of learning. I've heard your story. I've heard you speak like the two plus years of learning that it took you and all the pain that it took you to get to somewhere where the model that I believe that you have at DOXA, you know, was working inside of Gaiden, right? So I have a feeling that just specific to that opportunity, you were just better prepared because you went through it already. Yeah. You, you just had this epiphany to say, let me make it into business and help others. I don't want to put words in your mouth, right? But no, that's okay. I, but what, what, I, what I'm learning is a few things. One is you're really good at deflecting questions and turning it back on other people. So, <laughs> second thing, though. I want to answer it, but like, you know, it's, it just it just it's it just feels too open ended. Yeah, that's fair. I love though that you uh, were were concerned about mom's feelings in the new business venture. I think that's awesome. But I think my favorite part is it tells tells me a little bit something something about your personality when you start by saying this nice industry, and then you said, "Well, actually, it's crazy, it's challenging, uh, and it's exciting." And that the first word that came to mind for you was nice. With other people, would be like, "That is overwhelming. It's insanity." So I love that. Tell me, I love, um, I love complicated, complex situations. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned about myself post exit, especially, but even during the dream water journey is I, I, I gravitate to complicated, difficult, because I, I, I get so much, I don't know what the word is, but I get so much out of trying to just tackle these crazy challenges. I mean, even look at dream water, like the idea of a liquid sleep aid, a mainstream, simple water that helps you relax and fall asleep had never existed before. Right. Um, you know, cannabis is, is still a, a new frontier with so many challenges that you have to overcome. But imagine doing that even earlier than us, right? And, and we stepped in at a pretty early stage. Um, I love the challenge. It just, it, it geeks me up more than anything, more than money, more than anything else. I feel like that. I feel like that's a, um, a characteristic that is fairly common with entrepreneurs, whether they're good at it or not makes, you know, I can't really judge, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs are energized by that excitement, the change, the challenge, all that. And then when it comes to actually the maintenance level of business, we sort of disconnect. It's like, uh, let somebody else do that. Right. So I get it. Tell me about what you're working on right now. What are you most excited about today? Yeah. Um, you know, lately I've, I've been the, the learning and social chair for my EO chapter here in South Florida for the last couple of years. It's given me a lot of exposure to a whole host of entrepreneurs that I otherwise probably wouldn't have met or not built the relationships that I have, you know, within that. And I started to realize, you know, there's, there's been a whole cottage industry of, of, of maybe it's not a cottage industry, but a whole industry around coaching. Um, and I like this idea of uh, even LeBron James has a coach, right? So I don't care how good you are, what you do, having that person to guide, create accountability, see the things that you don't see, help you with strategy and vision and all those things matter. And I see that there's a lot of people out there, including a lot of my friends, you know, in EO and out of EO that have been very successful at it. But what I think I'm seeing is, is a gap between people that can give you homework as the entrepreneur, as the one sitting in that chair, and people who can actually help you get that done, whatever that is. A lot of times you don't even know what you have to do, right? And, um, and so for fun, to some degree, I've been doing strategy sessions uh, as long as I have a whiteboard and, and, and things and and and. And that's turned into really stepping in and helping entrepreneurs um, do do the executional side of the of the equation. Um, as much as I'll bitch about the work part of it, like like the mundaneness of legal and financial and you know accounting and all that stuff, whatever, I'm pretty good at it. 
and I can see things in a very clear way. And when I meet these really amazing, interesting people, um, I'm just so inclined to be like, but come here, let me help you. And I'm, I'm at the earlier stages of figuring that out for myself and what that looks like and how to monetize it. I welcome any feedback uh, from, from you or the audience or, or, or anybody out there, but um, I'm at the earlier stages of figuring it out, but I have some very dynamic entrepreneurs with some very cool companies um, that I'm, I'm, I'm now kind of a team member for. Um, again, I'm still trying to figure out how to regulate my own time because I'm not good at charging for, for my time. I'm, I'm not used to charging, even if, you know, with a legal background or whatever, I'm not used to time-based you know, reward, financial reward. Um, but I'm, I'm finding my way because again, I, I first and foremost get geeked up over the challenge and the opportunity. Um, and I gravitate toward these uh, people doing cool shit, if I could say it like that. Well, you, you did say it like that. So that's, that will keep it. So that's awesome. Well, look, um, we're getting close to the end. I think I want to just, I guess, ask for some perspective as a final question. I'll preface it by saying, like, you know, my belief is that we're living through, a fundamental transformation in the way that we work and live. I mean, a lot of it has happened with COVID. People always say like, Hey, you know, COVID sort of didn't really change much, just accelerated, you know, brought the future closer to us. But either way, I think, it, you know, in order for people to survive, it creates, it requires a um, borderless mindset looking beyond the way that we have thought and the way we, we've learned in the past so that we can grow uh, and lead in a dynamically changing world. So I guess my final question is what advice would you have, for a business leader today who is struggling to adapt as fast as the world is shifting. Where, where do you, just to be clear, not to deflect, adapt in what sense? Like what are you seeing is, is more of the challenge or issue? So I could speak to that. Well, I, you know, like I'll give an example. One of the big conversations I'm seeing today that, you know, the world is just out of nowhere, this sort of idea of centralized workforces sitting in an office all day long got, it just blew up. And we, we knew that, you know, remote and hybrid was coming, but it is now here and we're all having to, you know, force it. We're forced to look at it in real time. I'm just curious, like top of mind, what are some of the key issues you think that leaders are going to have to figure out or work their way through uh, in the near term? Uh, I have several thoughts that come to mind. Um, I can tell you from an experience share perspective that, once sort of I had that, that hiccup in 2013, at the end of 2013 with Walmart, uh, and I started to sort of reassess, why am I showing up in this office? Why am I here doing what I'm doing? I lost Joseph as, a, as you know, my brother as a co-founder and VP of sales. I lost Vincent as a co-founder and COO uh, in, that, in that sort of moment and whatever. And when you start to replace it with, you know, other people that just didn't necessarily feel the culture on the way up, most of the team was consistent, but didn't really feel it, you know, when it was like awesome and great and all that stuff, whatever. Um, I had one guy who would show up at nine and leave at five. And I just remember asking him, why? Why? Do you feel like you did a good day's work today? And if you do, leave at three. If you don't, leave at six. It's my mindset. And I would encourage, you know, those listening. It's, it starts with, in my mind, my mindset, right? Like, how do I view it? Um, and it wasn't because I'm going to outwork all of you because that, that was very present. It was very real. I mean, I was usually the first one in last one out uh, of the office, but to me, I, I never understood the idea of FaceTime um, and, and being there from this hour to that hour. I always, my mindset was always around what needs to be done today to get to tomorrow. Um, and that was always very present to me. So this idea of this borderless workforce and all that um, to me, it's more of a function of, how do you think about the work that's being done, not the time that it's taking to get there? Um, because if you, if you can detach yourself from the time, I don't really care how long it takes you. If you give me a contract and it took you an hour to give me a great contract or it took you 10 hours, I personally don't give a shit. I got a great contract, right? Just by way of example, you know, lawyers, they charge by time. Um, same thing here. Why should it be any different with anybody else? Uh, so obviously, certain jobs require, I'm not saying this is across the board, uh, you know, statement across every kind of job out there. But a lot of office jobs, if we can call it that, to me, it really was, a, you know, it's about shifting that and, and, and being focused on the outcomes of the work, not the time it took to get there or the how it took to get there. Um, I believe maybe potentially one of my roles as a manager is to help that how be as effective and efficient as possible. Right. But but that's it. Not, oh, why did you leave at this hour? You know, or why did you show up late? Because life happens. Right. At the end of the day. Um, the other thing for whatever it's worth, and we didn't get into this at all, but that came to mind is I can't tell you in how many 
places, especially where I have older CEOs or I interact with older CEOs or leaders or what have you, is that they'll flat out say like, I don't understand these millennials. Um, and I'm an older millennial myself, but I don't understand these millennials or, or God forbid the generations below. And, and fundamentally, I don't know that there's anything that's different for any of us. We all have kids that ideally, ideally we want to go see their soccer games, right? We all have uh, uh, gym time that we want to get to and fitness things that we want to accomplish for ourselves. We all have this desire to be with our spouse and do something, you know, not just dinner and be with them from, you know, seven o'clock at night to nine o'clock at night and then go to sleep. And if you think about humans as being humans, not what their age is or anything like that, again, this fits into this borderless world, which is we all have things that motivate us, that, that, that push us, that get us to there. Some of my best thoughts, we didn't get into this, but in COVID, I became a pretty big uh, cyclist. And some of my best thoughts, my best cracking of the codes or whatever happened when I'm the, on a bike. If I have to be at a certain place at a certain hour, I lose that. And also what that does to me from a mindset perspective, right? During the course of my workday, when I start a day having biked, you know, 25 to 50 miles, the rest of my day, and that's a small bike ride for me, just to be clear, but the rest of my day is just better. Even if it's spent in bed the rest of the day. And and when you look at all that, not every human's the same. Let's stop trying to label people into boxes. Let's stop trying to, um, you know, uh, force our own ideologies or ways of being onto other people. And in this borderless, frictionless world that we are living in, let's let people be people in a way where we're focused on the outcomes of that, not on how we got there and support the how in and when possible, if that makes any sense. No, I love it. I, uh, in fact, it's something I, I recently had a conversation with a, another individual and we were talking about the fact that we, out of nowhere, many businesses were forced to move from a management by site to management by objective, which is completely different skill sets and a completely different sort of ideology around management. But to your point, you know, I have, I have this belief that we can create the life that we want, but you know, we have to be given some autonomy and flexibility to be able to do that um, and still be accountable for what we need to accomplish. So I think it's awesome. Well, um, you know, for those of you that are listening, we've been listening to David Lekic from, uh, he's the founder of Dreamwater. Um, but Dave, if somebody wants to connect with you or learn more about you, where can they go? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, david.lekach, L-E-K-A-C-H. My email is david.lekach at gmail.com. Um, they can reach out to you, Dave, and you can connect them to me directly. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well, David Lekach, and and um, I, I make myself very um, available. I try to. Uh, I believe in paying it forward when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, and part of how to do that is you never know, you know, 30 minutes or an hour with somebody could help a lot. Um, and I believe that very much. And, and I encourage any of the viewers or listeners to, uh, to reach out um, and let's talk and let's see what happens. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for being on the show. I appreciate you. Of course. You too, Dave. Thank you for listening to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. Be sure to click subscribe to future episodes so you can hear from more top entrepreneurs and thought leaders. And we'll see you again next time.